Hey guys, Jason here. Just had a, an amazing conversation, actually two conversations with my friend for many, many years, almost 30 years now, uh, Sean Harnish. Sean pastors a church in Dansville, New York, which was just down the road from where my wife and I uh, lived in our early years of marriage, where we had our firstborn. And so I got to know Sean uh, during those years. Sean was a bandmate of mine. We've stayed connected and uh, I'm honored to call him friend. This is a fun podcast. We talk a little football on the front end. We talked about there's no us and them at the cross. That, that isn't the nature of God. We touched on religion and the damage it's done and how we've been set free from religious structures and systems that conflict with the love of God. We really dove into the rethinking journey we've both been on and practically what it's looked like for him as a pastor. Sean is in a small town where he's become more than just a pastor of the church in that town, a four square church, but he's pastoring the entire town and, and he does so in such a gracious and kind way in such a transformative way. And we had some technical issues the first time we tried to get together and after about a half an hour of interruptions, we finally decided we needed to pause, figure out the problem, fix it and come back together. And we did and unfortunately, due to poor scheduling on my end, Derek was unable to make the second half of this conversation, which I know he would have liked. That said, this is two conversations spliced together the best that I could. I think there's a lot of life in this conversation. Man, we went everywhere, but uh, you'll recognize uh, the deep places that Sean and I can go because of the length of time in which we've walked together. So thankful for him. Guys, my book is out, Leaving and Finding Jesus. If you've already read it, I would be so grateful if you would go to Amazon and write a review. This actually helps the rankings. It also helps people trust the book uh, before they buy it. Uh, thankful for you for that. And also so thankful for all the support that's come in over the last little bit. We're just, we're just blown away, blessed by folks' generosity. You know, A Family Story is a nonprofit. This is a listener-supported podcast. And uh, we're just so grateful to be on the journey with you. Anyway, guys, this is my friend, Sean Harnish. All right, I got it now. How's that better? Yeah, stud. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> hey, we did it. We're here. I was telling Derek about you, Sean, uh, before you got on and how far back we go and the music. I've been listening to you all morning from some of the messages you've preached more recently. Oh, seeing what I'm chirping about. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a lot of heretical stuff you're talking about. But uh, I'm in good company. Come on. Because <laughs> I was thinking, man, I want to get some fresh stuff from what you're running at in the last little bit. Some of your thoughts about let's not do politics. And oh, you got that message. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was swinging pretty hard that day. It was pretty good. I liked it. I took some notes. Um, uh, but you know the podcast. So, man, whatever's on your heart, I wanted to talk a little bit about, we've had heart to heart about the fact that you've been in the same town for a long time yes. and the journey that was for you from, you know, maybe even a, a young man looking for significance to the things that you've learned now about uh, the stability of staying in one place, whether it's your family or especially the fact that, man, you pastor an entire community. So I'd yeah. love for you to start there. If there's, is there anything you want us to hit? Well, I'll just, I mean, before it's over. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yes. We might need to discuss this. Uh, as he holds bill. up, hey, as I gotta, he holds up I gotta say, we mind. are all Bills fans now. I mean, the <laughs> yeah, entire the world. world. Our Bills yeah. fans, for sure. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I might have had a little part in infecting Jason with that. <laughs> okay. Today. Um, so, just saying. Let's start there. Let's start there. Let's okay, we can do that. Sean just held up a Bills mug. Sean and I go way back, and he, he has a huge part in my obsession. Go ahead, man. Yeah, it's a Western New York thing, right? You know, up here, it's just in the blood. Like any community, any region with their teams. But, but yeah, just love the Bills, love football. And, yeah. Uh, so I got to know Sean just around the time I got married. So 28 years ago, but we connected over music. We can talk about that. But when it came to the bills, I was a Canadian hockey guy, didn't have enough margin for football, but all you talked about, especially back then, it was like you were obsessed and Sundays were like Buffalo and, 
And so I, you know, just to be a good friend, I would interact with you, but I really didn't care. But man, <laughs> you're the kind of personality that I hung out with. I hung out with. And then there was the day you took me to a game. To a game. Yeah. 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 And it was the legit, uh, um, Derek. And it was a cold, you know, you had the heat warmers in your hands and in your feet. And we drove to the stadium. And as we're driving close to the stadium, we take a left into somebody's house. It's their house. And the driveway goes to their garage. They have the garage door open and a garage on the backside. And we drive through and it's a mom and pop who have about what? Enough yeah. room for 50 cars in their backyard. And they know who you are. They do Sean. They said, hello. We oh, drive yeah. through, yeah. give them some money. They let us get dressed in their home. Yeah. And then we walked to the game and that's Buffalo fandom right there. I, and then I watched, we played the Patriots and it was back when they had um, Bledsoe and I, but we beat them. We, yes. we, that was back when we were beating the Patriots. So that was it. I was hooked. So thanks a lot. 17 years of so, misery after that. Yeah. And here we are now and we're beating the Patriots again. So that's right. Yeah. It took a while. <laughs> Well, I got to tell you from the moment I met, met Jason. So now I now I know the moment that he drank the Kool Aid was yes. at the mom yeah, and pop house. Right You've met the guy. But I can tell you. I can tell you definitively that Kool Aid has altered his DNA. He is now <laughs> fills through and through, that's yeah. so and uh, that's all we hear about. That's but like I bad. said earlier. Uh, after the uh, incident on Monday Night Football, yeah. we're all Bills fans now. Yeah. Every one yeah. of us, yeah. the whole the whole that's world incredible. is a Bills fan. Hey, I feel like I'm just eavesdropping between a couple of really radical Bills fans. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we're going to start building some kind of shrine to Jim Kelly here any moment. <laughs> that's great for sure. <laughs> but uh... why I I don't know if Sean was hearing it, but you were really breaking up there a couple times. There you go. You're good. That seems better. Yeah. All right. I've known you a long time and I know that you um you've yeah. been in Dansville along and I've watched pastor and raise your kids uh and 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 pastor through your through the true other organizations that you're a part of. Yeah. I can certainly just start off by speaking to my journey here and, and kind of surrounding the idea of pastoring a community for sure. Um yeah, let's do that. Okay. So basically, one, I never set out uh, to be a senior pastor. That was just not what something I was necessarily after. Uh, uh, when Jason and I met, um, I was a youth, you know, youth pastor and a music guy, and I was quite fine with that. And uh, was really after that music dream, and that's really where Jason and and my road connected. Uh, was very much on music, um, but I was working at the, the same church. It was my first assignment out of Bible school, and. Uh, the senior pastor was a church planner and he, he decided he had to go on and plan another church and the denomination. Um, they actually approached me and said, Hey, we really like you to consider being the, being the senior pastor. Honestly, at first I was against it. I thought they don't know who they're asking. <laughs> um, give me six months and the church will be empty. I'll disappoint everybody. I was really, really worked up about it. Um, but through a lot of prayer, a lot of consideration, uh, I obviously went ahead and, said, all right, Lord, uh, I, I can do this if, if, if you're with me, you know, and you walk with me. And, and a big part of it was, is I just never identified as, as a reverend, you know, and I mean, no disrespect to the title at all. I just, I had kind of a stereotype or a stigma with that term reverend, you know, and I'm like, I am no reverend, <laughs> but I can be Sean. So my Bible story was, it was really David and Saul. Uh, Saul tries to put all his armor on him and all this stuff. And, David's like, basically, I can't do that. I got to, I got to use my sling and what I know to do. And that was the premise for, for me pastoring. I just, if I can be me, you know, then I can do this um, as long as I don't have to pretend to be something else. So that started my journey. Um, I was always quite active in the community, working after school programs, uh, coaching. I have coached, uh, you know, basketball and baseball and football and soccer. I've had my hands on all kinds of coaching that has been awesome. Great way to get to know people in the community is through the sports Yeah, and just love doing it. And I still do it to this day, uh, still coach. And we have, and a long time ago, uh, a guy named Jim Scott, who, who nobody would necessarily know, but he was a former vice president of Foursquare. And we were hanging out one day and, you know, and he come to visit me in little old Dansville and it's a small community. Um, you know, in the village, it's maybe 6,000 people proper. Uh, if you start pulling people off the hills, <laughs> you might double yeah. that number, um, but it's small. 
And I used to get discouraged about numbers. You know, I, I was wrapped up in that race of got to grow a big church. And that became a bit of a trap for me, um, for sure. This guy, Jim Scott, said to me, not everybody who's a part of your church is going to attend on Sunday morning. And, and that hit me. He says, you ever thought in, in essence of what it means to pastor a city? And that kind of really was like, wow, what a different perspective. Uh, stop worrying about and obsessing about Sunday morning attendance. Um, it'll be what it'll be, right? We do the things we should do, but it'll be what it'll be and just love on the community. And uh, right. that coupled with a challenge, he said to me, he said, if the doors of your church closed, would the community even care? Would they even miss you? And I thought, wow, you know, that was another one of those Holy Spirit kind of, you know, stuck with me. And I thought, wow, that's a great question. Do we matter to this community? And that, that was the other trigger point for me in saying, um, yeah, I hope this community would miss us dearly if we shut down. And I think today we could clearly say that we serve in all kinds of aspects. Now we do have a community center. We run a very large daycare after school programs. We partner with the, the local uh, village municipality and we run their summer recreation program. We also house and, and administer the, the collective food pantry. All this has just been because of our willingness and wanting to make a difference in Dansville. And the freedom for me was when I stopped worrying about getting people to church on Sunday morning. Now, tons of people have come and, and, and through those relationships and connections, but that's not my focus or obsession anymore. That's just yeah. not what I, what I hang on to. I, um, and it's really funny, you know, I've been here, I came in Dansville in 1996, became the senior pastor in 2002. So that kind of gives you an idea. And I always thought, well, I'll end up moving on. I'll go somewhere else. So I'll, you know, there's got to be more and this and that. And it's, it's been interesting that the Lord has just kept me here. Um, and I've come, I'm at peace with that, you know, for sure. Um, very much at peace with that. And, uh, and just realize that's okay. It's what he has me to do. And uh, now I joke and tell people, uh, well, for, uh, for a small town, we are a mega church. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. But um, to this day, it's exactly what we do. We just serve the community. We love on the community. And it's kind of funny in the past. Well, not funny because uh, I'm going to talk about funerals, but it, um, I've become the go-to guy for funerals for people who don't mm -hmm. have a church. And uh, that's an odd thing. I never thought about that, but. But I thought at first I was like, why are people calling me for funerals? I, they don't even go here. And God reminded me this because you're pastoring the community. You're just, you're here to serve everybody. And the Lord challenged me that whenever I get asked to do a funeral, my answer needs to be yes, period. You go do the funeral. And, uh, and so I do tons of funerals um, and I don't mind doing them. Uh, it's an honor. And the Lord's really given me a different perspective on that to, to serve those people and help them, you know, with, with such an obviously difficult time. And I do a lot of weddings. Yeah, you know, I get a lot of calls for weddings too. <laughs> Obviously, you know, there's something to be said about just putting down roots and staying put and being faithful with the people that God brings you. Um, I love that you're doing these funerals for people outside the doors of the church. It obviously speaks to the trust and the safety they feel um, placing probably the most difficult experience of their lives into your hands to help navigate it. Uh, that's awesome. I mean, that's that's truly a shepherd's heart. That's the heart of Jesus. And man, uh, I want to come visit Dansville now. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to have you. <laughs> I, I I love um I've all you've always been a guy who said can count on. Uh yeah, Jason, your audio is just really in and out. Um, you're just not a Zoom guy. Yeah, and apparently I'm not a Zencast, so we gotta figure this out. So <laughs> Um, Jay, give me a call on my phone and we could talk real quick and, and come up with a quick strategy for this. Nice to meet you, brother. Likewise, and you know, Jason, we'll get it worked out. Don't worry about it, brother. Anyway, man. Yeah. Been, uh, I'm, I hit record. Yeah, you, you got good levels. Doing okay? All right. Good. So this is the second part of, of the interview because of technical problems. Um, and Sean and I just re-caught up. It's two weeks later. The Bills are out of the playoffs. We just did our own podcast conversation <laughs> true <laughs> around that but i want to pick up where we left off we were talking about how you've become the pastor of the town community centers all the rest of it but yeah man you were about to dive in yeah so i think what i would hit is 
to give some context to that, um, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, I read all the books too, you know, and, and becoming a pastor and we, and we all read these books. We go to the conferences and it's this guy and that guy. And, and a lot of the focus back then was how to grow your church big. There was a lot of yeah. emphasis on that, right? How to become right. a mega church and uh, how you do it. And here's the tactics and all that. And that, for me, led to a very depressing place Sure, because <laughs> I tried to cookie cutter, apply some of that stuff, and it never worked. Sure. It just didn't work. Right. And I found myself in a spot where I felt like a failure. I really yeah. did. I, I remember very clearly it was 2008, and I was just done with it. You know, I'm, here I am in a small town. I think there's maybe 6,000 people right. in the town, the village itself, right, you know. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I couldn't get the church over 200. I'd get close and, you know, just – and I was convinced I was a failure. I was like, yeah. I can't do this anymore. This sucks. I'm awful. I, I'm not good at it. And anyways, I it was so bad. I took a sabbatical. I looked up right. what it meant first <laughs> because <laughs> everybody throws that around. I'm like, I think I need one of those. Yeah. I remember. So I literally took off on my motorcycle and I drove all the way down to your neck of the woods. Right. Uh, where North Carolina and Tennessee meet. And they, there's a drive down there called the tail of the dragon. Okay. Uh, very cool. Very cool motorcycle spot. 311 curves over 11 miles. It's awesome. But that was a long haul on the bike, right? Yeah. A thousand yeah. miles down back. And that's when I really had a God encounter, which I needed desperately because I was done. Yeah. And it was the coolest thing ever, that God encounter. Um, you know, by the time I quieted down and just did a whole lot more listening. Yeah. Um, you know, I really started to sense one, just God loves me, period. Right. And, and stop being on this performance cycle. Like I had to earn it. Right. Like I had to achieve something to, and I felt a big release in that. Right. Um, another big passion point for me, you know, was being there for my kids and being a dad, being the dad I never had. Right. We talked about that eons ago. Yeah. And I really felt like the Lord said, you know, if you had a mega church, how much time do you really think you'd have for your family? <laughs> and that thought hit me. Right. And it was right. like, and I literally felt like God said to me, I'll give you a church of, you know, 500 or a thousand tomorrow, but all that time you spend coaching your kids sports and being in the community and connecting with them and being with them, you're going to lose all that. Would you take it? And it was so funny, man. That was the, I was like, absolutely not. No, right. right. I would not trade that for a bigger church. Right. That was the release. Wow. It was huge. Yeah. That was everything to me at the time. And so that's when this whole thing of becoming a, a, a pastor of the community kicked in. Right. Yeah. What I love about you, and I mean, we've known each other a long time and we've had similar dreams. We've even partnered on them over the years and especially those early years. Yeah. Yeah. But over the years, as I've watched you navigate, there's such a faithful way in which you've lived. And from the very beginning, you're, you're not real religious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, in fact, anything that smacks of transaction, you, you hold it suspect and, and are easy to talk to about it. You know, I, what I love right now is that you're in a situation where you're actually pastoring people who don't know Jesus. Oh yeah. You know, I've, I've done weddings for people. I don't do a lot of weddings. Uh, um, I find uh, weddings, <laughs> when I say to my wife, every time someone asks me, I'm like, remind me to say no from the last time. Because in my mind, the only thing you can do in a wedding is screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, people aren't necessarily living in the same values that I hold. And suddenly they want me to do their wedding. And back in, back in the day, I would have had a, I wouldn't have seen the humanity. I wouldn't have seen it as the opportunity to become part of their lives and part of their future and, yep. and a, a way to connect because I'd have been too caught up with my concerns about whether they knew Jesus. And, and these are real things. I care about that, but sure. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're pastoring a community. Sometimes you're in a, you're going to find yourself in positions that are way outside your, your understanding. And, and yet I've watched you love people, man. I'm sure you've got stories there. Yeah. No, you're right. And, you know, of course, our, our classical training would be, well, they're unequally yoked. You can't, right. you know, there's no way you can marry them and all that, all those things we were taught. Right. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't know about all that. I, I hear you. I understand. I, I, that's pretty important. I get it. Um, but I see, I just flipped the script in my head and I'm like, it's an opportunity. Yeah. 
like you said, to get to know them, to meet them. Uh, they're going to get married anyways. Some people call me out on that. I, I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable with that. Right. Um, it just doesn't bother me. Right. And the other thing I use it for is say, hey, you know, you could have went to the justice of the peace, but you asked a minister. That's interesting. And I use that as a springboard. I love that. You know, I marry you before God. So let's have a conversation about that. What do you think? Right. You know, um, yeah, I can do it by the authority of the state. But at the end of the day, I, I'm marrying you as a representative of God. So, and it's awesome how many doors that opens yeah. and, and putting that out there. So that's fun. You know, I, I, I enjoy doing it. You know, and it, I could tell it means a lot to people when you do it. So I'm, I would guess that you're, you're the guy they reached they reach out to as well when it's not going well. Eh? Yeah. I get a lot of that too. A um, lot of funerals. Um, yeah. And then that became a thing. You know, our classical training, how are you going to do a funeral for somebody who wasn't a believer? What are you going to say? Right. Are you going to lie and tell all their fans and family that they're smiling down from heaven on them? And I'll, you know, I've had people challenge me on all that, you know, I'm like, okay, well, one, I don't know what's going on with that person that passed away. <laughs> funerals are for the living. Right. So I'm going to focus on the people that are there. That's really good, dude. You know, I'm not so, I don't know what's going on with whoever passed away, um, but I can be there for the people who are hurting. Yeah. And how cruel do some people get? Like, what do you want me to do? Pronounce the guy, like the, pronounce the person that they're in hell. Right. Like sometimes I feel like they want me to do that. Yeah. Like, well, you need to let them know the truth. I'm like, ah, I could smell a I could smell the barbecue now. <laughs> you, what do they want me to say in a funeral? <laughs> like, Man. And there's this penchant. And, and you hit it when you said I'm not very religious. I, I definitely struggle. And I mean religious, you know, in a negative connotation as yeah. a legalistic kind of spirit kind of thing. Yeah, transactional. And I just find it interesting. And years ago, um, we would have people visit the church and we've had uh, people who were um, definitely uh, LGBTQ, you know, right. all that stuff. And I've had people come to me, you know, how can you have lesbians come to your church? I'm like, one well, of the jokester, he's like, oh, I'll let you in. It's usually how I respond. <laughs> like, like um, you know, a little bit of that, like, relax. But it's funny how I notice people want me to either condone or condemn. Yeah. Right. They're pushing for me to do that. Yeah. And I, I just finally, one day I had about had enough of being pressured on that stuff. And I finally just said, not my job. I, I, it's just not in my job description. I don't sit on any thrones. It is not my job to condone or condemn. I, and I'm not going to do it. What I'm going to do is what I think is pretty clear is my job. And that's, I'm going to love people. Yeah. Right. I'm a, I'm a build a relationship. I'm a love them unconditionally. You know, I had somebody get upset with me because I uh, baptized two people who were uh, um, transgender. They made the switch or whatever. Right. And how could you do that? And I said, well, this person, we'll call him Steve. I just said, I just met this person as Steve. That's all I know. Steve came to me and said, I love Jesus. And I want to make a public proclamation that I, you know, to everybody to know that I love Jesus. Right. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. I don't, it's, I just, I'm not going to, I don't care. Wow. Right. <laughs> yeah. I focus on that. And I took heat on that stuff and right. it's like, that's okay. You know, lead them to Jesus and they, and they fall in love with Jesus. The Holy Spirit's way better. All that other stuff than we are. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like let him do his thing. Yeah. If I got hit with everything I ever did wrong all at once, I would just give up. Yeah. You know, the Holy Spirit, walks with us. And I guess I cling to that passage. Um, you know, he was faithful to begin that work. We'll complete it. I don't see anything in there where I have to do it. Right. I just have to, I feel like my job is to participate, to be a willing participant. Right. And let God and the Holy Spirit do the changing. That's it, man. I mean, I, I imagine you've taken heat for a a, a numer, numerous amount of things, especially what you just talked about. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, we've both felt that a little bit. I, I love how you said that, that this is the Holy Spirit's job and you're not sitting on a, a throne. I, I'm i convinced that if you're not positioned uh, with the father, you know, towards the prodigal, then you'll find yourself uh, the older brother. You just can't help but at some point find yourself 
participating in this game of us or them for or against and you're suddenly counting sins and and by the way jesus wasn't in the sin counting business you he know was not. He, he literally was asked about it uh who sinned this 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 blind man uh, is, is born blind who sinned him or his parents that he was born blind jesus says wrong question then goes to a cross and says father forgive them they know not what they do, which they sure seem like they knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Corinthians tells us God's in Christ a reconciling world uh, uh, to himself, not counting our sins against us. And, and so when we have this conversation, a hell conversation, a, a LGBTQ conversation, uh, it's almost impossible to have it where you don't feel the pressure to pick a side yes. or to participate in sin counting. And I'm like, look, I'm not ignoring that the wages of sin are death and that we are navigating a broken and fractured world. Mm. But my job as a beloved son of God is to be loved and to be an expression of that love, that reconciling, forgiving, redeeming, restoring safe place in which when, when the person is navigating, when the person is lost, that there, there's a safe place for him to come. And that's what I've loved about your journey, man, because, you know, there's been years where we've gone without really connecting. Right. You know, we have that deep friendship where we get back on the phone and we go deep. Yep. But I've watched you navigate some of the same waters that I've navigated in a very different context, in a very yeah. different, even culturally, where you're located, your location. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we've come to some of these similar places where I think we've put all our eggs in the basket that God is love. And his love is good. Yep. And my job is to live there. Somehow live there. Yeah, that's it. That, that's 100% it. And I had to go all the way back to my own experience, right? I was a very resistant teenager when it came to um, church and, and Jesus and all that stuff, right? I was think the last one in my family to, you know, come along on that. Right. And uh, I can remember going to church, and this is, you got to go back to the 80s. You know, things were still very conservative, Yeah, but uh, it was the 80s and I played guitar. So I had really long hair. It was yeah. cool hair, yeah. by the way. And uh, <laughs> and I can remember going to church because my mom made us, you yeah. know, so it's, yeah. it's, and certain people were like, you know, you got to cut that hair. You got to do this. You got to do that. You know, and it just turned me off. And, and I was very argumentative anyway. So I would sure. say, well, Jesus had long hair. You know, I was always <laughs> quick to fire back. Yeah, no. And that was always fun, you know. Back when we I were never... arguing long hair. Way back oh, yeah. when we were Can you having... imagine? That was a, <laughs> a real argument back then. And uh, Oh, my goodness. And I was a punk, you know, and I was – I definitely was rebellious, and I like pushing the envelope. I remember another time the pastor uh, told me I needed to cut my hair, and I told him – I stole a line from somebody. Um, I can't remember who it was at the time, but it was like – you know, the only recorded haircut in the Bible caused a man to get his eyes gouged out and became a slave. I don't think I want to do that. You know, and I was, I'm sure that guy just wanted to hit me with a ruler or something. But, but all that to say this, though, there was a youth pastor's wife. Um, Patty was her name. Every Sunday I came, she'd come over and give me a big hug. Oh, I love your hair. I'm so jealous. Oh, your man. hair is so nice. And she loved on me. And wow. I would be a punk and I would push and I was rebellious and she wasn't having it. She wow. would just love on me wow. right where I was at. Wow. You know, Oh, I love your holy jeans. They're so cool. You know, and, wow. you know versus um, how dare you wear those to church, you know? Right. And right. she's like, man, you got a good look. And you know, and, and it, <laughs> she was relentless. Wow. In choosing to love on me. Wow. And I'm telling you, that's what finally got wow, me. Wow, man. Well, that's what finally life. broke me down. What's her name? All those years ago. Patty. Yep. Patty. Thank God for yep. Patty. <laughs> it's the truth. It's, it's what did it. Oh, my goodness, right? man. I She just I, loved me through everything. That, and that's uh, love is what transforms. I, I was years ago. I don't know if I told you this story. I think I've shared it on this podcast at least once. But I was when I was a family pastor at a Methodist church and I was I was you know, you know, the book I just wrote I've, is about a God that doesn't punish. And so, you know, even then I was unwrapping that idea and I was saying that God, uh, God doesn't do punishment. And I said this statement about, you know, hell has never changed anyone. But there was an older woman in the church. She'd been 20 years saved, 
or maybe 30 at this point had come out of a dark place was one of the one of the women that we trusted right one of the matriarchs and she stopped me and she said jason she said i need you to further expound on the idea that hell doesn't change anyone because i you know i got saved because of hell was what she, mm-hmm. she told her salvation story i was in hell and hell played a role in my salvation and, and so i said i said you know Take a moment over the last 30 years and find something in your life that has been transformed. I'm not saying discipline, but something that you've, where you've been changed, you've been transformed, where you no longer even, des- you think that way, you don't desire those things, you just live out of this good, this beautiful place. I said, take a minute. She's, and I said, you know what, let's, let's, everybody, let's do this, everyone in the room. And then she, she, uh, she said, okay, you said, you got something where you're transformed. I said, yeah, let me ask you a question. Was it fear of hell and punishment that changed you or was it encounters with his kindness and his goodness? Yeah. And I get teary eyed when I tell the story because she just suddenly started crying with a big smile on her face. She's like, it was the kindness of God. It was the goodness of God that changed me. And I said, that's what I mean. I said, you're not transformed by hell. Hell's never changed anyone. It's never saved anyone. I understand that it's part of the narrative, part of the story. We've all tasted it, experienced it. We've all yeah. felt separated from God, which is the to me the one of the great ways that you could define what hell feels like That's right. separated from love you feel it but it has never been true and the the gospel good news is that it, it is the kindness of god it is the kindness of god that leads us to repentance i mean that's what you just told me that's your story that's it that's it that's the truth yeah and you you pastor that way man that's to yeah. me that's how you pastor a city that's how you pastor your kids and your or if you want to say how you love your kids and you love your wife yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And that's, that's funny. Cause you, you brought that scripture up and I, if you didn't, I was gonna, that's a, that's a hallmark scripture for me. It's this kindness yeah. that leads to repentance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it isn't, it isn't that somebody doesn't need to repent. I need to re, re and it's the good news that we can, sure. we get to change and align, but, yeah. but, but boy, isn't it incredible that we are ambassadors of kindness? Exactly. That's, that's our calling to be ambassadors of yeah. kindness. I, I tell you what, I, I wrote about it a little bit, but uh, and when I find a leader and I find unkindness, especially and I'm w- someone who's un- unaware of it or unwilling to repent from it, I man, I run from that leader. That is an untrustworthy person. Shit. I don't want any aspect of their leadership in my life. I've been under authority with the Sauls in the world where you can't take your eye off them because if you did, you'd get skewered by a spear. Spear, yeah you can't trust that guy and what i love about the journey i've watched you take is is it's one in which you're trusted you're trusted by people in your community they trust you to me that is that is something earned over time through faithfulness and it is the highest compliment i could ever say to anybody is that i trust you yeah that's cool thank no that's anyway, that's man, awesome I'm, I'm, you don't always think about those things you know you just kind of do what you do but but that's that's nice to hear. And, uh, and I think you're right. People do trust, um, you know, that we're, yeah. there's no ulterior motives here. There's no hidden agenda. There's nothing yeah. like that. Um, you know, and yeah. that's fine. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. journey for sure. I, I just find it that, um, the pressure, the pressure, especially in leadership to be against, uh, and the pressure you've faced over and over on, on, uh, uh, you know, a myriad of, of topics as that go far back all the way to, to, to how long your hair was, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I have a tattoo. I joke, I'm, I'm 48. I have a new tattoo. I'm like, you know, nice. all of the, the younger generation, I tell them, go find a 50 year old Christian who has old tattoos and thank them because they paid a high price. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> they did and they paved the way that's a great line that's so true you would never think no because back in the day if you had a tattoo when i was a kid if you had a tattoo it meant one of two things yeah. you had a crazy past life like if if i met a, a tattooed christian it meant you were had a, had a crazy crazy past life which was i wanted to hear about it yep. or you had backslid at one point yeah, exactly <laughs> you, you definitely came out of a biker gang or something right <laughs> <laughs> right so true 
And, uh, uh, man. Yeah. So we've, we've come a long way, but there was once upon a time when I would have described boldness or something as like we were somehow battling the enemy or whatever. But honestly, man, I, I look differently at it now. I, I look at what you've done in the, with your life and your kids and the legacy. And I go, there's a boldness that you've lived in a town as the same town for as long as you have. And you've lived endeavoring to be kind, endeavoring to be available uh, and, and not taking sides. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that I don't know that it's possible to be trusted uh, if you're playing the game of of us or them. Yeah, I, I love the way you put that. And and what is it in our society that always wants to push, you know, that false dichotomy? Like it's got to yeah. be this or it's got to be that. We do we do it in everything yeah. from politics to you know sports, right? People yeah. harass me because I like you know I also have an NFC team I like a little bit. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> well. <laughs> Sorry, but I do. I do reject that. I really do in my life. I, I reject that notion. I, you know, another thought I had when we were talking was, you know, I really feel like love is the one. I feel like it's the one thing the enemy doesn't have a uh, a response for. Yeah. So what I mean by that is when you choose to love, you know, and I think that's the stuff Jesus Jesus was getting at when he said, Turn the other cheek. Right. Love your enemy. Right. Don't re- repay evil for you know. And I feel like uh, Jesus, obviously being a pretty sharp guy, <laughs> you know, knew that the enemy's got no answer to that. Yeah. Right. And I've experienced that in my life a few times. Yeah. Where I might be justified in being angry or not being this or that by my man's standards, but when we choose just to love, anyways, bro. Um, I it's powerful. I just. Bro. You know, yeah. What do you do with that? It's it's so powerful. I don't. Matter of fact, I don't. You know, God's obviously the most powerful thing, but but I feel like that love is the most powerful thing He gives us to wield. Yeah, I think love is the definition of His sovereignty. Mm. I use the language sovereign love uh, when I was writing "God is not in control." Yep. I was juxtaposing the idea of of a power that was based in control or a power that was based in a love that lays one's life down yep. and that they're two different paradigms. That was that whole book and that the sovereignty of God is not in the context of control. That's actually the antithesis of love Yeah. early on. And I, I, I said it to a, a friend at a coffee shop that, uh, that God is not in control. He said, how do we win in the end? Uh-huh. And my response was we already won at the cross. Yeah, we already won. And, and it happened in a way that is unfathomable to a mind that is in any way participating in the knowledge of good and evil in dualistic thinking and for or against or in hierarchy because it happened through the unbelievable revelation of a love of a, of a man who laid his life down yeah. for his friends and said, Father, forgive them. And, and I don't know how it works in this, man, in this ru- world we live in. I mean, you're, you're rubbing up against it oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah. We're seeing the cruelty of this world and the, it seems to be louder and more, there's more polarization than, than we've maybe ever seen. And yet I've got all my eggs in this basket that, that uh, there is a, a love that was displayed by the God man, Jesus, uh, that is more powerful yeah. Uh, than anything else on the planet, and 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 it is this love that is reconciling. And yeah, exactly. And uh, certainly, at times, it takes right that the the you know, old Pentecostal terms, but but the filling of the Holy Spirit, right, yeah. so that we can flow out of that love. Yeah, because it's that's always not always natural, right? You know, that's the battle we're in. Yeah. Um. You know, and so it's like so important that I don't really have a whole lot of love to give unless I'm getting it. <laughs> like I need it from God, you know, yeah. if I'm left to my, my own devices, my own nature, sometimes I win a lot of times I won't. And, uh, so I found that to be a real key part in my life is that reliance on God and the Holy spirit and making sure I'm flowing out of that. Dude. That's been huge for me. Guys, the book is out leaving and finding Jesus. I'm so excited about it. In this book, we trade a punishing God for reconciling love. We exchange the lens of retribution for the transforming revelation of God in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Wherever you are on the journey, I really believe this book will encourage you. So it's available now on Amazon or at our website, familystory.org. Buy it. Buy multiple copies. Share it. 
And then do me a favor. If it's blessed you, write a review on Amazon. Guys, I'm so thankful for you. So thankful to be on this journey with you. Praying life and joy and wonder over you today. All right, let's get back to the podcast. Oh, oh, oh. I say it this way whenever I speak, right? Even probably when I was up there last, which was, you know, before COVID. Oh, wow. I, you know, I got one message. God is love. His love is always good. And then it's this part. I exist to, to grow sure. And what you said, we, you know, I, I'm convinced that if, if love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors, you love yourself, is the greatest commandment. If, that, if this is what it is, then the Rosetta Stone, uh, uh, way to interpret the whole thing is in first john uh, for we love because he first loved that what you're talking about is is my job this morning isn't to love you my job if i if you want to use the word job or my privilege or my honor or my joy is to be more aware of his love because then then i'm you can only give away what you have like then it is a natural outflow yes yeah, of, yes, of, yes yep yeah i, I mean that's that's it. Right. That's, you got it. Yep. That's a beautiful thing. Yep. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. That I'm relearning at 48, right? That's it, brother. I mean, it is too. No, I was going to um, throw something out there just for discussion because I think it's interesting. And, and I know you faced a lot of this. Um, and I have too. Um, uh, you know, obviously right now, even the title of this podcast, right? Rethinking God yeah, and yeah. deconstruction and reconstruction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes I feel like we're in the civil war era. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For me, I, I guess I got to a point where I wasn't afraid of the string pulling, you know, the house of cards falling. Right. So yeah. I'm interested in that with you because I think a lot of people, they're so scared of that. There's a, right. there's like a fear that, you know, it's got to be this neat, tidy package and it all has to make perfect sense. And, sure. and I guess I just finally got to a point in my own walk where I was like, um, my kids, I always encouraged my, my kids to ask any question they wanted. Right. And boy, they threw some zingers at me <laughs> um, over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I got to a point where a couple of times where I had to be honest with them and say, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how right. that works. I don't right. have that answer. Um, and I would tell them, but I'm okay with that. And, and I, and they had, and that doesn't rattle my faith. Right. And that became kind of this thing with me. It's like, I don't have the answer. I can't make that work, but it doesn't rattle my faith. Yeah. And I think some people for their faith to be solid, they need this systematic theology is really what it is. And they need it to be foolproof. And, uh, I don't know. I'm just saying if you do enough critical thinking and reading there's cards that are missing in the deck or are getting pulled on it. And I watch people kind of in vain fight, you know, to shore up something that looks pretty weak to me well, versus like, Hey, my job, I ain't gotta make all yeah. that stand up. Uh, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm, bro. A man who knows everything scares me. Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think we were raised in the age of certainty. Hmm. And certainty is the absolute opposite of faith. I mean, yeah. if, if you just took a step back, faith is mystery. It's We were invited into the mystery, yeah. but we were raised in the age of certainty. And then, man, you go to Bible college when both of us got ourselves a, a, a Bible degree. Yep, absolutely. And that's not necessarily, a, a, and there's a lot of beautiful, good things. Most of what was good and beautiful were those places of encounter and experience yeah, true. and relational yeah. connection. And then there was some good th things given to me on how to study and, 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 and some good, sure. some good insights uh, as well. But I was also given a, 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 a sense of certainty that was not helpful. And I, for me, the, the place, and I've, I've probably talked about it on here, but in different contexts in the, in the light of the question for me, and everything is a sum of its parts. So having had good parents who loved me faithfully and all of those things and the encounters and the experiences all along the way. But for me, the phrase, when I heard this phrase and it was Bill Johnson who first said it, he said, Jesus is perfect theology. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was the simplest second grade level statement that shook me to the very core of my being 
uh, in the right moment in which I suddenly realized that I had a whole lot of theology that wasn't Jesus. Mm. And so that phrase, and then this idea that God is good, which I was raised with, but I, I went into this idea that Jesus is perfect theology and God is good and good uh, as Jesus revealed because Jesus is the definition of good. Mm -hmm. And that for me was the place in which I was suddenly open to, as you say, pull the string. I literally, when I released the book Prone to Love, I had a friend say, you're pulling the string that unravels the universe. <laughs> and I, and I, I chuckled. I said, if I had that a power, man, yeah. uh, I mean, wow. all, I, do not, I do not have the ability to pull any. If, if you think I have the ability to pull strings that unravel the universe, it's probably needing to be unraveled. Yeah. Um, but I know what he was saying. He was saying, right. you are throwing some ideas out there. They're addressing very, the very foundation of what I believe, and they're undermining some of those foundations. There it is, too, and, yeah. And this phrase is what's kept me, because this is mystery. Early on, I adopted this phrase. And we're talking in the middle of trusting God, following him to the best of my ability, obedience, risking all the things that we did, you know, going jumping into a ministry, moving kids without money, miracles, all of that stuff in our life. So all of all of the practical opportunities to practice it was this phrase, I don't know, but God is good. And and that beca that has become a family motto. It's become a life-saving phrase for me. I don't know, but he's good. There's so much freedom there to be able to go, I have a certainty. It's that Jesus loves me. Mm -hmm. Like there is a certainty. There is such a thing as gravity. I didn't leave certainty. I just found certainty in love. It isn't about control. It is about a, a love that lays its life down. It, I can trust it. That is the place where I can, if you would say certain, or I can put my trust. Yep. And that trust is not about at the end of the day, how I can work out uh, my, my doctrines. That trust is in a God who, whether I understand him or not, is good. Like Abraham in the context of broken and fractured thoughts about a God who might require child sacrifice, walks his son up a mountain. And it's not about his obedience to destroy, to, to killing his son. It's by faith. Abraham believed that God would resurrect his son. That's right. It was essentially saying, I don't, I don't know, but God is good. Yes. I love that. And I'll put all my eggs in that place. Right. Right. That for me, uh, that for me gave you, gives the freedom. Then man, you don't have to know. You don't have to have an answer. You, and and bro, isn't there great freedom in that place? Yes, yes, right, hundred percent. Yeah, especially as a pastor, because I've been on the stage when when you've given the message, and you gave it with passion and authority and conviction, and then you do a Q and A, and they ask a question, and all the pressure on you to have the answer to the question, and it takes yeah. you have to stop and go, I don't know, I, I don't uh, know. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. It's, I love that. Yeah, I love the simplicity of that. Actually, you know, just that lens, right? Of yeah, you know, Jesus is perfect theology. Yeah, right. um, it's a pretty safe place. Yeah, there's an old thing I ran into and in, called Occam's Razor. I don't know if you ever remember yeah. that, but it's the simplest definition. Is tends to be the right one, right? And it, it made me think of that. It's like we can get lost in so many weeds in theology, right? And you know, and arguing and. Um, you know, so many classic arguments and stuff. And I, and I like that. The simplest definition is often the best one to go with. And your definition of, or Bill Johnson's whoever, but it's, it's adopted. Right, right. Jesus is uh, perfect theology. Yeah. And I don't have to have, and I don't have all the answers no, no. to some of the questions. And and like you said, that part of that's the idea of faith. Yeah. <laughs> kind of is inherent in the whole gig, right? Right, right. <laughs> Right. It's like, right. And faith and trust are their, their, their neighbors, they're married yeah, the same yeah. coin and, yep. and you can't have it without trust. And so for me, I don't know, but he's good. And he looks like Jesus. Mm. And then for me, like what you said, uh, I found a whole lot of places where God wasn't good and he didn't look like Jesus. And some of those places I found in the Old Testament, some of those places I found in the New Testament, but mostly, most of it was the lens of somebody else's interpretation based on a God who wasn't like Jesus. Yep. And so for me, what happened was um, it was risky and daring at the time. I've, I've talked to a lot of people, though, and this is a, a very common thing. I literally, in that season, 
without telling anyone because I lived in the same world that you did where some people would have a problem with long hair, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. but I basically, I basically, without telling anybody, I just read the gospels for two years because I, I was like, I am not leaving the gospels. It wasn't, it wasn't anything religious. I just couldn't afford to Yeah, I get because that. anytime I would, I would, I would jump back into the old Testament. I would begin to perceive how it, I would read it through this literal lens that I'd been given this inerrant, uh, absolute certain lens that I've been given. And it wasn't, it w- didn't, it would conflict with Jesus and it, it would undermine my faith. And so I just, I didn't do it. I just didn't touch it. And I know that there'd be good academics and people out there that at, at the time certainly would have wrestled. This was 15 years ago. Oh, but yeah. That was, that was how I did it. It was, it was, man, I'm, I'm not touching anything but the gospels and I'm going to basically clean the lens and until the lens is only Christ crucified. And Paul said it. I, I will only preach Christ crucified. That's powerful. Like, yeah, yeah. That is the only gospel I have. It is, it, and, and so that became and has continued to become my lens. And then along the way, you know it. You uh, you start to look through that lens, and then you you all of a sudden start to rediscover scripture, the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. You also begin to find people who can help you navigate the Old Testament through the early church fathers and and the Eastern Orthodox, and you, the church gets wider and more beautiful. And you realize that. some of the ideas that I'd grown up with were were only a couple of hundred years old and have been put upon me, uh, uh, and they are nothing like Jesus. So I can dismiss them. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, a lot of it's not that old. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people wrestling yeah. with different thoughts all throughout, right? Yeah. I mean, I can remember when I went to Bible school, the big debate theologically then, you know, was the whole idea of free will or right, right. the elect, right? That was right. always such a yeah, a yeah, big yeah. deal, you know, and we would We had we had conversations about that way back in the day. Yeah. You know, the whole Calvin Arminian yeah. thing. And that was such a huge, massive debate. And then one day I just, the simplest thing, um, if God's not trapped in time, right, then both end, who cares? Right. <laughs> it undoes the whole argument. It, it really undoes does. the whole problem. Yeah. If, if you don't, if you don't keep things trapped on a timeline. Yeah. And, and um, by the way, if God is trapped by time, then time is God. Correct. hundred <laughs> percent correct on that. Yeah. Right. And I know it's kind of heady stuff, yeah, but it's, yeah there's some value in understanding yeah. that like right. he is outside of that. Yeah. And, uh, and that's to me, be- it was the beginning of certain things like that. Like I used to take the whole free choice and elect, I used to take it in faith before I had any kind of thought around it or, or over it. Right. I would just say, even back then I couldn't explain it, but I would say somehow it's both. And uh, right. you know why? Cause I read both. And right. You know, I see it both in there. So I don't know. I'm okay with it. Right. Um, And then later, you know, I read some crazy astrophysicist, theologian, a guy named Hugh Ross. And he said, it's not even a problem if you, you know, go into this dimension and go outside of time. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. See, I knew, I knew all along it wasn't a problem. I just didn't know how. (laughs) Right. And to me, that is a, that's a faith statement. That is, I don't know, but he's good. I mean, that's what you were doing. Yeah. That's what I'm getting at. I don't know, but he's good. And I'm going to, I'd rather, I've said it this way before. I would rather live in the mystery of, I don't know, than in the mystery around his goodness. Hmm. I can't afford to undermine his goodness, but I can afford not to know. There it is. And and for me, I would, I would rather live. Uh, I would. So for me, faith is that thing that says he's good period. I will not leave that. And that doesn't mean I understand it, but I will not leave it. And I'd rather live in a mystery around Job uh, for the foreseeable future than to undermine Jesus yeah, and what he revealed about the nature of God. So that's where you're being sure of his love comes from, right? right. I yes. get it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah that's exactly it. Yeah. I'm sure of that. Yeah. And I'm okay if I'm not sure over here. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. can live in the mystery of a whole lot of things because he's good. I like the way you put that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very parallel roads, you know? Yeah, you know, they are, man. We've been it's friends for years, but, it's, you know, we've also had a lot of distance and it's so true though. Yeah. I've really come to yeah. a lot of the same conclusion. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, there's a freedom in going, I don't know. <laughs> right. And, and I don't need to know for my faith to be right. attacked. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I, I've even back to that conversation about hell, which we've, we've had certainly over the years, many times. 
yep. uh, you know, I get the real need for people to know, but honestly, I think a whole lot of the real need for people to know is because of the, the, the fact that they've been preached a, a punitive perspective on health for so long that, that now they have to know. Whereas I'm like, man, I'm so convinced in his goodness. And I'm not playing that time game, by the way, yep. right? Like to me, God is not time. So for me, the, you know, that makes for a great Hollywood movie, right? That trope where, yeah, where yeah. you know, there's a, there's a bomb and you got to just cut the red wire, the blue wire it blows. Like that's a great movie. It's yep. called the, uh, the Race Against Time. It's, they use it all the time uh, yeah. in, in Hollywood. We love it. I watch almost every movie's got it. There's a ticking time clock, and and ultimately everybody everything has to happen, and that's what gives this movie its impetus. It's sure. why we watch it. With yeah, that's faded breath. Good observation. Yeah, yeah. And, and and we play the same game with the end of our lives, as though there's a ticking time clock. There's a bomb, and once it goes off, it's too late. It's smithereens for everyone. But if you're not playing that time game, if you're like, no, God is love. His love is measureless. He's not playing in the realm of, he, he can participate, but he's not, he doesn't submit to time. Love was before, love is after. Yeah. Then then you can sit with someone at the edge of, of the bed with their brother, which I did a couple of years ago with a woman uh, as her brother was, uh, he passed the next day and I came and I visited and uh, she wanted me desperately to pray with him. And I know she was hoping he would pray with me, but he, was, he wasn't, able to, wasn't able to do that at that point. Mm -hmm. We made eye contact and I loved on him and I prayed with him and I prayed over him. And, uh, and I imagine he prayed with me. But when I sat with her, um, she was distressed over one main issue. Now, it was the issue of whether or not he would be in heaven, whether or not he'd prayed the prayer. He'd, you know, he'd lived a bit of a rough life, but he was a kind man. And so she was, she was trying to tell me all of the ways in which he was kind and all of the ways. And I stopped her and she, I could see this terror. It was, she was being traumatized and terrorized by this penal substitutionary atonement lie in the ether that had been put upon her and she'd been abused by it. And in this moment, I saw it as abuse. I saw it clearly as abuse. And in that moment, I broke it off when I basically said, I, I believe that what Jesus did on the cross is over your, over your brother. And I speak that I just, I, I, I set her free from that and I spoke into it and I had no qualms about it. I felt the Holy Spirit over it. And, 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 and for me, if there was anything in that moment, I was mad at the fact that she was living under the, uh, under the, uh, broken yeah. retribution of the lie of separation in this moment that she had to, to navigate that in this moment. I, and I love that. that. What you were sharing is something I would totally do when I get called in. It's like, yeah, I love that with the, you know, Hey, so-and-so's this last few days. Okay. You know, and you're right. It's like, um, I've preached it a million times, right? The, the, the bean jar theory that so you, and she went there. You know, the good jar, the bad jar. And somehow I think he, he probably has got more beans in his good jar than his bad jar. Right. And I always tell people, there ain't enough beans in the world. Right, right. <laughs> right, you know, to, to get that jar there. That's right in scripture, right? It's, right. Yeah. You're not going to earn it. it. You know, it's it, that's <laughs> not how it works. Yeah. And it is funny how I would say the vast majority of people operate on that concept of the bean jar. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, and that's county and what's funny to me is yeah it's so simple as far as like what you say the gospel good news is it's not the bean jar yeah we're back to sin county yeah yeah county right. sins we're at dinner there's an enormous bill <laughs> and he's like i got it you know you don't have enough beans don't worry about it that's my pleasure yeah that's the good news he did it it's right? finished and, yeah yeah i love that and so it's almost like to me that's such great news like Get off that hamster wheel. You don't have to spend your life there. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a terrible place. Uh, and also remind me one quick thing. My good, good friend and mentor, uh, Foursquare buddy, Art Snow. I know you remember Art, and I just love Art. Yeah. And just, I don't have a ton of mentors, but he was one of them who really impacted yeah. me. Yeah. And I remember years ago, he said to me, man, I don't know about all this stuff. I just teach people to fall in love with Jesus. Wow. And I find that that's yeah. how, that's really what we got to do. <laughs> and he goes, teach them how to fall in love with Jesus. And and then the rest kind of just falls in place. And again, that just such a simple philosophy of, of ministry. Wow. And I realized that like, again, profound, like 
I don't have to yep. correct them, fix them, train them, turn them into this, turn them into that. Um, you know, get their theology perfect, get this and that. Yeah. He's like, no, I just yeah. lead them to Jesus, man. And, uh, and teach them how to, you know, to fall in love with Jesus. And he goes, it will just, it always works. Right. It takes right. care of itself. That's what he said to me. And he goes, don't ever forget that. Like, the jobs on some levels, it's easier and you're making it is what he would tell me. <laughs> yeah. And I never forgot it. You know, it's just those nuggets you get Man. throughout your journey. And that was one of them. I, I always held on to that. That's amazing. That's amazing. I need it to be simple to me, man. Uh, you know, that's, that's partly how I'm wired. I just need it to be simple. And I think the gospel is that it is simply loves us. And, yeah. and, uh, and boy, I, I, you don't have to look for me. That's just true be in my own life. Like I don't have to, like, I don't have to look too hard to figure that one out. I'm like, yeah, yeah. The more I'm in love with Jesus, the more I know he's in love with me, uh, the more transformed I am, the better husband I am, the, the more present I am with my kids. All that. You know, yeah. The more yeah. wisdom I have to navigate the day, the more grace I'm walk, walking with and from. <laughs> yeah, brother. That's, yeah. That's, so that's, true. That's so good, bro. That's so good. I think maybe the the simplicity of it frustrates people um, for whatever reason. I actually had a, a gentleman say that to me once. I, I did some kind of a gospel message, you know, whatever. And right. He actually said to me after church, you make it sound so easy. You make it sound so simple, he said to me. So simple and easy. Right. Like, and, and there was a skepticism in him. Like he couldn't accept the fact that it's that easy. Right. Like, you know, just embrace Jesus, man. And he, he choked on it. Um, he really did. I, uh, you know, and to this day, that guy, I don't think is doing well as far as, you know, being a Christ follower or anything. Um, he just couldn't accept it. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, uh, the paradigm was too hard for him. And I'm thinking, wow, I, I've, I've had those conversations. I've, yeah, I I'm, have, I'm sure the Pharisees, right. You think about, wait right. a minute, we got a system here, man. <laughs> With Jesus, like, slow your roll. Don't be messing with this. We got it all laid out, right? And you got to do this, 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 and this. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus comes in, man. You, you, I could see why they just wanted to tear him apart. <laughs> like, you know, in the sense of from their perspective, like, he just blew up everything. Right. You know, he upended their whole yeah, government, yeah. their system, everything they, you know, you know, and they just lost control. Man. Well, you know, back to the, the, I don't know that that conversation is going to make it in, but we were joking about how I love the law. Uh, every every Sunday I participate in it, but it's in the afternoons. Yeah, and I watch a football <laughs> game and, and the, the brilliance of the law taking place on a field. But if you think in the context of sports, right, like like how quickly you can lose yourself uh, based on a bad call and spend the rest of the day. Yeah, you know, um, it, 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 I find it interesting how many, just as a football fan, how many laws, how many rules and subsets, and every year they're making new rules. Oh, yeah. you know, they got to continually, continually make rules because that's the nature of. So that's of, very um, interesting. Yeah, think about what constitutes a catch. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Earlier in the season, Poyer had that interception. Yeah. I remember it so clearly. Yeah. And it got taken away from him i'm like he caught the ball i know i know i know i know i love it i and i hate it but that's but the subset we love it and we love to just there are it's a billion dollar industry where people are talking about it literally for hours and hours every day on podcasts and tv shows showing in you know in slow motion what a frame by frame frame by frame and that's the law and jesus shows up to that and says yeah i'm not playing that game literally we love it we we love that game we love the game yeah, you're on. right we understand it we can control it we that's feel it. like we're in that's control it. Of it. we feel like we're yeah, yeah the perception yeah. is that we're in control and yeah. jesus comes in and goes ah we flips the whole apple card up right it's like, we're not <laughs> we're not doing that you know it's like that the, the kid in the gym right when you're playing basketball he comes in and just right. starts playing barn ball <laughs> right it just upsets the whole thing right Right. Uh, I don't even understand this game. I don't have this to dribble. This game doesn't seem to have any rules. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's just one rule. What is the rule? Uh, humble yourself. Uh, you know, take up uh, your cross and follow him. Uh, yeah. Love one another. Yeah. I, uh, it's good, bro. And it's still upsetting people to this day. It is. Right? They, is, they yeah. choke on it. Um, yeah. They just absolutely choke on it. My heart is, you know, they'll, they'll get 
they'll find freedom too, man, in love, you know. Yeah. It's back to the kindness, back to the kindness. Yeah, that's my heart for them. I, yeah. You know, I, and I don't, when I was younger, I, I fiercely debated, right? And I loved to catch people. And, yeah. you know, my mom always said, you know, I told her I want to be a rock star, but she would always say, well, probably lawyer or preacher. <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> and because uh, I just always loved the verbal, you know, yeah. kind of navigating. And that's so funny how we do that stuff. Yeah. What I love about your journey and, and it's been mine too. Cause I think when you're young, I think we all have a lot of that, you know, the need to be right over connected. Yeah. Well put, well put. Yeah. And the older you get, the more you realize, um, that need to be right is directly connected to your ego. And, and, you know, so that you, you, you're, boy, there's a freedom there when you, when you're able to step away from the, the need to be right. And man, that's so, that's so well put. That's got to at least be a chapter in one of your books. Coming <laughs> up. That's cause that's important. Yeah. That really is important. Doug. Yeah. That's a huge breakthrough in life. I can, when you get through that. I remember someone uh, wrote a long, um, well thought out um, um, uh, uh, knock on my book. I can't remember. I'm trying to word. I've lost the word, but basically uh, challenging uh, the book prone to love. A rebuttal of sorts or whatever. Yeah. A rebuttal. Yes. And it, but you know, sometimes you'll just get a, a bad review and it's just like the person, re- <laughs> it showed up with a water stain. One star, you know, okay. you're like, whatever, I can, yeah. I can deal with that. Or even if somebody's just got a theological lens and whatever, but, and there, but this was a, this person had spent at least a day gotcha. on this rebuttal. I had gone through scripture. They had taken lines from the book and then used a scripture. And so when I read it, I didn't know what to do with it because I, I, it was overwhelming. And I, I got to the Starbucks and I was working on a new book, but I put it aside and I opened up the tab and I start to write my response and I'm anxious and I'm feeling frustrated and defensive. And I feel, I hear my father laughing. I hear my heavenly father. Like I just get this sense that he's laughing at me and I, and I'm like, and then I hear him say, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Like, he's laughing at me. What are you doing? And I, and I said, well, you know what I'm doing? Like, I have to respond to this, this, this woman, and it's going to take me a I have to do this is people will get confused and I'm using other people now. Right. That's like yep. people, it'll, but the people will be turned away from whatever, you know, and he just starts laughing. And this is what he says to me. He says, and, and I'm going to say that what actually he said to me, cause sometimes he talks to me like this. He's like, okay, but whatever you do, just don't make shit up. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to tell you what happened to me, man. He was like, he, he's like, cool. Yeah. You go ahead and do that. Just don't make shit up. Like knock yourself out. That's what, yeah, I get it. And, and what it did for me was I re- it, it just released me. I realized, oh, cause I had already learned the lesson, but this was a moment to apply it where I went, oh, I'm not here to be right. And I literally re- erased everything I'd done. I put, closed it and picked up the book and said, oh, thank you for that freedom. I don't have to respond to this. It's not my job. I'm not here to be right. I'm here to reveal you. Like there that's it is, why I'm right? here. And so much freedom in that. And you know what's crazy? Three years later, I finished the book that that uh, was God is not in control. And I finished that book and I release it. And it's out a couple of weeks or whatever. And I'm going back through and I find that old uh, rebuttal. And I read it. I hadn't read it in three years. I read it. And I, as I'm reading through it, I go, oh my gosh, I answered that question in chapter three. And I read the next one. Oh my goodness. But I completely answered that question in chapter seven. And I realized, oh man, God's yeah, good. Well, like, like I'm on the journey. I didn't make anything up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, man. I get that too. Um, for sure. But, uh, so- dude, we got to talk tacos. I've had you, okay. I got you an hour. This is a long one. We do this again because I love this. I would love to anytime, man. It's such a joy. You know why we did the taco thing? Uh, Because, and by the way, for those listening, Derek was on the first time we connected and I messed up and didn't get him the, the, the date for the second time. And he, uh, he texted while we were actually talking. He's like, Oh my gosh, have a great time. I'm, I'm, I'm out. So, um, but, uh, we called it tacos because, uh, I'm, I'm not an academic and I did not want to be taken that way in the rethinking of God. Uh, so I thought that was a fun way to spin it, but it, it's led to Absolutely. great conversations around food and tacos. So this is pretty traditional that, that I ask you, what's your favorite taco? Uh, just straight up like classic hard shell, 
I, I'm not a soft shell guy. And uh, you got to understand that that's classic American classic. Yeah, I, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm like Ortega, man. You know what I mean? The stuff my mom used to cook in the oven. Classic. <laughs> like gone. A, yeah, yeah. <laughs> classic. It's so funny. That's so awesome. Right. Me- Mexican Tate Taco Bell. I get it. No. Um, but no, I just like that. I got to have crunchy. Yeah. Got to have crunchy. Spicy is good. And uh, I'll probably eat just about anything as far as meat. Doesn't matter to me. Dude, that's awesome. I'm good there. Is there like somewhere you've been where you're like, yeah, I'd do that again? Because I remember, if I remember right, back in the day, you were pretty picky. Yeah, uh, definitely um, choosy with food for sure. Yeah. It, it matters. <laughs> right. Um, for sure. <laughs> um, but no, I. You know, I think I would eat a, a, a so up in our neck of the woods now, um, in Geneseo, which you'll know. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a place over there called Rancho Veo, uh-huh. and uh, it's fantastic, man. Nice. Like it's just this family that opened it up, and they kill it. They kill it. It's authentic. Well, it's authentic to Gen- our area. <laughs> no, no, I <laughs> and, believe uh, it, man. Yeah, it is. Like it used to be. I think it used to be the old Starbucks there. Okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and. Uh, Man, they're killing it. It's and it's. I always want to go in and tell them it's you're too cheap. You're selling it too cheap. <laughs> like my business side, you know, because it's really reasonable. Right. But they're they're refried beans. Oh man, and there fresh lime and uh, it, it's amazing there. But a there lot of go. times I get uh, um, there. I I go with fajitas a lot. I'll mix it right. up. But yep. it's so good. I try different things every time. We'll have to get sure. you down. We have a spot around the corner that uh, is one of my favorites. But we have, I'm in a spot with, with a lot of Hispanic people. So we have taco trucks, literally, man. Oh. I, I can almost throw a rock and hit one. Like, and I've tried them all. My wife, sometimes I come home and she's like making dinner and she knows. <laughs> she knows where I drove and she's yeah. like, you stop. You got to stop at the taco truck. I'm like, yeah. I only got one. I only got one, which is a lie. I got two. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's awesome. So I got a crazy taco store for you. Yeah. Give it to me. A good one. A good one. So you remember Troy, Sun yeah. Lightner, our good yeah, friend yeah. Troy. I love Troy. Eons ago we used to run a concert series here called the flip side concert series. And we'd yeah. bring in bands from all, you know, the small yeah. old church had no business bringing these bands in, but we would do it. Right. That and was back in the day, man. Yeah. We would catch bigger bands as big as we could get. You know, right. we had plank guy in here and disciple. Right. Our trick right. was just to catch them in between cities. And it was a, right. you know, they could make a little extra and have a hotel to sleep in for the night. All that aside, we had disciple here that time. And, uh, we had a guy in the church who still goes to church here who's an amazing chef, like just really makes good food. Well, right. He felt like it was his ministry to feed the bands. Right. And so he would always make these home meals, like incredible, everything. One time he made tacos and he did soft shell, hard shell for these guys. Well, Troy was like, hey, man, uh, when you go up to the house and come back, bring me, make sure you get some for me. Right. Sure, man. No problem. Uh, how do you like it? And he, he said, uh, he's like, you know, just put a, just a dab of like Frank's in it. I like a little kick. Well, when we got to Russ's house, he had that Dave's insanity sauce. Okay. And uh, that, you know, there's a million of them now, but back then right. Dave's was right. well known. Right. So of course I took a soft shell taco and I just plastered it. Um, I mean, I just plastered it with right, Dave's, right. Yeah. wrapped it up, didn't say yeah. a word. And we came back and feeding the band. Everybody's hanging out. Troy started eating that thing, and he almost had to go over to the hospital. <laughs> like he was starving. He tore into it. I mean, he had sweat. He was getting dizzy. Like he felt like he was going to pass out. <laughs> and uh, he had to sit down. And like um, they were getting oh ready God. to take him to the emergency room. He right, couldn't, figure, right. couldn't figure out what happened. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I put some of that hot sauce in there. You like? <laughs> He was so mad at me. Um, yeah, it turned into that. Dude, that's that's not even funny, man. Right. Like, that, was, that was serious. 
I could have ended up in the hospital. You know, he's trying to make it serious. I wasn't having it. <laughs> um, but that's probably my favorite taco story. Like right. I almost took a brother out with that's Dave's awesome. insanity sauce. <laughs> oh my gosh. And Troy is awesome too. And when it was all said and done, I'm like, well, did it taste good? Right. <laughs> you know, and he's like, well, it was bad. <laughs> but yeah, he's pretty mad at me. Man. He was pissed. <laughs> And, he's uh, amazing all humor yeah. for me you know and, yeah yeah shout out to troy who's pastoring up in uh in, in enemy country if we're talking about us and them he's up in patriots yeah. country he is just outside of boston yeah. just outside of boston yep love that guy man he was his he was the first post i saw after the game yeah still my bills still my team you yep. know you i saw that I, I i liked it too i did yep. too. i saw it I was like, all right, uh, buddy. I'm not there yet, but <laughs> at least we beat New England, so he's he's safe for another year of being, he's happy. being beaten up up there. But man, this has been good. We'll do it again. Absolutely. How do folks find you? Uh what's the best way to connect with you if they wanted to to touch base with you in any way? Yeah, I'm old school. Um by that I mean probably Facebook is the quickest way. Right. Um People still go on there, don't they? They do. I think so. I think so. That's what I've heard. What's um, your hand what's your handle? Yeah, just my name, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Harnish. Harnish. Yep. If you do the old at Sean Harnish, you'll find it. And we'll um, we'll have a link on the website as well. Yeah, that's a good spot to connect. I, would, I, I accept everybody's friend request. Drives my wife nuts. She's like, you need to be more discerning. I'm like, nah, I want to be friends with everybody. So I say yes to everything. But yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, that's awesome. uh, instant message, <laughs> private message me. I, I'm good with all that. It's fun. Right. Dude, love this. I love having this conversation and, and I, I, we, we need to do it again. So yeah, for sure. Love you, man. Yeah. I love you too, Jay. It's so good to connect and uh, Hey, there's always next year. There's always next year. Hey guys, we're so glad that you are joining us. You can find me, Derek Turner at rivercharlotte.com. That's my church. And I'm on all the social medias yes. as pastor Derek T D E R E K pastor Derek T. I'm also on Twitter uh, at Jason Clark is. You can also go to afamilystory.org and everything's there. If you sign up for our mailing list, we send out a weekly email that has uh, articles, podcast information, and uh, we also let you know about new books coming out or events that we're uh, connected to. So yeah. uh, like, share, retweet, and uh, and man, if you could write a review, it actually does something for the rankings. It, it, it does, it yeah. Available, so. But a five-star review. Course. Yes. You know, if you can't write a five-star review or something, <laughs> like just don't even write don't, a review. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like if you can't say something nice, don't say anything, don't say at, anything all. at all. I, I like that. And then apply that to this podcast. <laughs> That's my motto. That's I like what I do. I love it. So love you guys. Appreciate you coming on the ride with us. God bless.